Um, yeah, so coming up next, I'm really excited for our conversation um, that's happening next. So it's all about acting on commitments to equity and fundraising and beyond. A lot of organizations have commitments to equity. Um, and this conversation is really going to be about what does that actually look like in practice and really just hearing from these amazing panelists. Um, so Tristan Penn has uh, wide experience at organizations, mostly youth development organizations over the last 16 years and is really just bringing his um, wealth of experience and knowledge into uh, leading this really valuable conversation. So thank you so much, Tristan, for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having uh, not only myself, but uh, the three other panelists that we're going to be talking to today. So that's really exciting. Thank you so much for the intro. Um, very excited to be here. And um, just wanted to give some brief background on myself. Um, I work for N10 as the Community Engagement and Equity Manager. And so um, what we do is we make technology more accessible and um, more um, friendly for nonprofit professionals too. So that's something that we um, really pride ourselves on doing and I work on the community side of things. Um, like Candace said, I worked in um, youth development nonprofit for um, the majority of my nonprofit years. And, um, you know, I identify as a Navajo man as well as a black man. And um, it's that lived experience as well as um, working in nonprofit and experiencing things firsthand has really informed and shaped how I now move forward as a, um, a nonprofit professional in in the sector so um that's just a little background around about myself um also i'd just like to give a bit of an acknowledgement of just the continual um moment that we're in right now um we're in a pandemic we are experiencing as a country police brutality white supremacist systems the disproportionate but intentional systemic targeting of black folks and indigenous folks and other folks of color for centuries. Black Lives Matter and changes are happening around with cities that are announcing decisions to pull officers from schools to defund police departments. There is so much going on right now. And that is hard stuff and it's also good stuff. And our nonprofit missions are almost always wrapped up in all that hard and goods too. So um, I just want to hold space and give a moment of reflection and silence for the lives we know and those that we don't that have been taken. Um, I'm just going to give a moment. All right, so um, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I just want to give some intros into what we're going to be talking about today. Um, diversity is something that is a blanket statement um, and a blanket thing that a lot of nonprofits have worked with or added on to their work. And there is indeed an, a, a diversity of how nonprofits work with diversity and incorporate that into their day-to-day -day operations and also with regards to racial equity as well. So those have implications for how we fundraise and how we market as organizations. So we need to start somewhere. So today we're going to focus on advancing racial equity and work wherever you're at within your organization too. So I'd love to um, introduce our, our panelists that we have today. I'm, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves um, as opposed to me <laughs> um, introducing them. So we'll start with uh, Jessica, your name, your pronouns and the organization um, that you do work with. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica Butler, pronouns she, her and hers. I work with North Londell Employment Network, which is a premier workforce development organization on Chicago's West Side. 
Our mission is to improve the earning potential of the North Lawndale community through innovative employment initiatives that lead to economic advancement and an improved quality of life. Specifically, we help formerly incarcerated men and women and others who experience high barriers to um, employment to get a job. We help them improve their ability to su successfully navigate the job market, secure sustained employment, close educational gaps, and improve their household economic income. I serve as the Chief Development Officer where I lead the financial growth of the organization and manage the organization's brand over overseeing our marketing and communication strategy. Thank you. Wonderful. Welcome, Jessica. Um, so nice to see you. Um, also, I forgot to add my pronouns. My pronouns are he, him. And uh, Floyd, let's go to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm very excited to be speaking with each of you today. My name is Floyd Jones. Uh, my pronouns are he, him as well. Um, and I work with the Volo Kids Foundation. So our mission is to use play to build communities of active, resilient, and confident kids. We want to unlock the power of play for every kid everywhere. And we do that through basic pro, um, sports programs. We offer anything you could really imagine. Um, but since 2015 in our inception, we've been able to serve over 12,000 kids in six cities nationwide, Baltimore City um, being our home city. And it's actually, our organization began right after the uprisings um, of Freddie Gray's death in Baltimore took place. Um, we really work with community partners, community organizations, and other liaisons to really create a safe space and have a safe outlet for kids to be able to play. Um, and it's been very interesting because, you know, such a time as this, we're realizing even more the importance of being able to break down barriers through play. Um, and so we operate in Baltimore City, Washington, DC, Boston, San Francisco, Denver, um, and in New York. Uh, and we use play as a way to bring people uh, and communities together. So that's me. Wonderful. So good to see you, Floyd. Welcome. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least, uh, Minal. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Minal Bopaya. Um, so uh, my pronouns are she, her, and my name is pronounced Minal like subliminal or criminal or phenomenal, whichever one like works for you. Uh, and I am the founder and principal consultant at Brevity and Wit, and we are a strategy and design firm where our mission is to bring more diversity to design and to bring a design mindset to diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in organizations. And so our clients span um, a lot of different nonprofits, international NGOs, uh, public media, as well as some professional services firms. So I'm here uh, more as a DEI consultant uh, than a nonprofit professional and hope and totally defer to Jessica and Floyd interest in, in their work, um, but hope I can provide a different perspective and angle on things. Wonderful, thank you, Manol. Um, so let's just start where we are all at, y'all. Um, where are your organi organizations, and I, I know a lot of you already alluded to this in your introductions, um, but where are your organizations at with regard to statements and commitments? And how does that impact the work that you all do. Um, Jessica, let's start with you. Sure, so North Lawndale Employment Network does not have a formal statement on equity. However, our commitment um, to equity and inclusion is really baked into our, our, our mission, our core values, our impact statement. It's, it's really who we are. We consider ourselves a social justice organization with workforce development being a means to achieve that end. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say that, you know, every staff meeting that we have, it begins with the resuscitation of our mission statement. And I think this helps keep the staff grounded and focused, knowing, you know, our purpose really here is to serve um, our, our community and, and, our, and the most vulnerable residents in our community. So again, I would just say, um, while we don't have a, a formal statement, um, on equity, it's it's really baked into who we are as an organization and and our our purpose. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, you know, um, I think that some organizations um, go at it in different ways too, and I really love that um, that idea of just like that is just how we do business. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's just baked into what we do. And so I, I love that too. And also just kind of going back to the beginning of every time y'all meet of let's refocus and recenter ourselves. I think that's really wonderful. Um, Floyd, let's go to you. How does your organization work with that? Yeah, so we, uh, we also don't have an official statement. When I first started working with the organization three years ago, uh, we, you know, we had loose language around, you know, being an equal opportunity employer. But, you know, the reason why I love, you know, this, um, this panel discussion is actually called more than a statement. And when I was looking at our organization from a different lens, I was like, okay, well, what are the different things that we, you know, do? What are the practices that we employ within our organization to actually make diversity a priority? Mm -hmm. um, and it was, you know, it's interesting. We, so many people in our organization, I felt like, you know, wanted this to be important and wanted this to be at the forefront of their minds, but didn't fully understand how to engage with it, whether it be in a statement, they didn't want to step on toes, they didn't want to, you know, say the wrong thing. And so one of the things that I put into place is, you know, figuring out, okay, well, what does diversity actually mean for us? What does it mean to us? And actually being able to survey the people, survey our employees, survey our colleagues and the people that we work with, uh, and then go from there. And so for us, we don't have an official statement, uh, you know, as Jessica mentioned as well, but we're trying to figure out how does this actually interact in our day-to-day -day interactions? How are we implementing this in our marketing? How are we implementing this and actually how we conduct our business? So, yeah. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Floyd. You know, um, I think in the, within like the past three months, um, our CEO, Amy Sample Ward, and I have um, gotten numerous requests for help around crafting statements, um, both collectively, she and I, and individually. And I think one thing that we've noticed, not with all of them, but just with a few, is um, there may be, you know, good intent with <laughs> wanting to craft a statement to start somewhere, but there's also, there's this virtue signaling um, aspect of that too. So it's not, I mean, again, going back to what this session is called, it's more than a statement but also sometimes you need a statement to start to grow from that seed. And so it's really important. The statement is all right, but also you need to make sure that you're watering your plant and watering that seed and making sure that you're just not planting a seed and walking away and feeling like that's all good. So Manal, I know that you had um, done some work around that and helping um, organizations craft statements. Do you wanna talk a little more about that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I've actually uh, had num a number of conversations with nonprofit and for-profit organizations about external statements. I want to sort of separate out also external statements about your support for DEI and external statements that might have been in response to the murder of George Floyd. You know, those are two different things. Um, and I think the external statements around DEI are really important, particularly if you actually want to recruit talented people of color. Um, I know I used to look for that when I would apply for jobs. Um, and, and it also depends where you are in your organizational journey, right? Like you really need to understand what that means because um, for both types of statements, authentic authenticity is paramount, mm. you know? So I actually wrote about this on LinkedIn because in, in the, the number of statements I saw after George Floyd's murder was, it's a very mixed response and um, I wrote about it and I, I think I said something like, you know, it is, it is better to be authentic and quiet than loud and hypocritical mm. at the moment in time. Yes. And um, there was also some research from Pew that I think um, somebody can probably stick into the chat too, that said that most people felt that the external statements were the result of pressure, not genuine concern. And at the same time, most people, particularly black people, thought that it was generally a positive thing to make those statements mm -hmm. because those statements, even if they were the result of pressure, was better than silence. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, if you're going to make an, a statement, you better, you better know what's happening in your own house because you will be called on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, you will, and you should be called on it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like... Um, you know, I, I have a real problem with people like Amazon putting out statements and saying that they're going to celebrate Juneteenth, but not giving contract workers health insurance or paying taxes. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> kind of like, you know, like, right. and I, you know, and, and they should be called out on those things. And so, um, and, and sometimes that will lead to even conflict within the organizations. Cause sometimes I have advised people 
not to say Black Lives Matter, not because they don't believe it, because, but because I was like, you're, it's not a PR hashtag. And this mm. organization hasn't done enough work around this to flip a switch from, you know, from not talking about this at all to Black Lives Matter. And, and what kind of turmoil will that cause in the organization where there isn't mechanisms of accountability mm. if people start retaliating based on that? right like that actually puts black and brown people more at risk mm. you know yeah. so you know get your house in order is the first step <laughs> then we can talk about external statements and yeah. what you should be doing there absolutely great point um you know we've talked a lot i'm going to shift gears a bit we've talked a lot about the last three four months um i know i'm based out of portland and we are going on 90 plus days of um, consistent protest um, that's been happening downtown, um, about a block away from where the N10 um, headquarters is um, downtown. And I know to varying degrees at different cities across the country, there have been consistent protests um, going on. And um, I'm just curious with you all, um, has anything changed in your work in the wake of protest? I, I know Amy and I at N10 have received a lot more um, solicitation to want to help or advise um, in regards to racial equity and um, DEI um, work. I'm just curious if, if it's been the same for you all, what has been the, um, the feel for that? So um, Floyd, let's start with you. Yeah, I would say, um... A lot of people, so our organization, we're the 501c3 arm of a larger for-profit um, company, and they uh, touch about 250,000 people annually that participate in, their, in the work that they do. So uh, because we, you know, we play such a big role in the cities that we're active in, there were, I would say, a lot of eyes kind of looking and seeing, you know, what are they going to say? What are they going to do? And how are they going to operate? Um, and I think that our organization, you know, kind of switched gears from being an organization that does go, go, go all the time to really mm -hmm. listen, listen, listen. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that, you know, um, Manal, you said that just really resonated is like, you know, saying, you know, anybody can say Black Lives Matter, but if there's no actual like substance behind it, then it's, it really just falls by the wayside. Okay. Uh, and being yes. one of the, yeah. And one of the people, being one of the people in our organization, one of the few people of color in our organization, one of the things that really, you know, caught me by surprise, but also made me very proud is that our CEO, you know, took the time to call me and actually say, okay, you know, not necessarily being like, what do we do now? Because I think that he understood not putting the burden fully on my shoulders, but saying, mm -hmm. I feel like this is an area in which we can grow in. And if you have any suggestions, if you would like to be a part of that process, mm -hmm. I would love to hear from you. And so I would say one of the things that I really appreciated, um, and I oversee fundraising and development for the foundation side is actually being able to say, how are we changing and transforming the trajectory that our organization is operating on, as mm -hmm. opposed to just saying, okay, what do we do, need to do now? Like, let's get this next statement out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so I would say that's one. And then two, I would say is also continuing to listen to our constituents. You know, we talk a lot about accessibility and access for our kids. Um, you know, we always say we're trying to break down barriers and make play possible for all. But one of the biggest things, especially because we're in the midst of a pandemic, right? So it's like we're facing two pandemics on the same side. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of families were asking us, you know, this is great, but we don't even, you know, we, we switch to virtual programming and saying, okay, how can we offer virtual play for our families? Um, but a lot of our families were struggling with having computer access and how Having consistent internet access. And so what we did was we partnered with local organizations that provide access, they provide laptops, they provide, you know, internet. And we said, okay, how are we working with them to bring this to our families? Is that in the scope of our immediate work? No, but is it something that our families need? Yes. You know what I mean? And so being there and actually being a bridge and saying, I'm not going to just give you what I think you need. I'm going to listen to you and be there for you and serve you in the way that you're asking to be served. And I think that that's like a paradigm shift for so many different organizations, at least for us anyway, um, because it's so easy to just put your own agenda first. But in a right. time like this right now, we need to listen and be there for everybody in that way, so. Great, yes, thank you. Uh, Jessica. Absolutely, so I, at North Carolina Employment Network, we are a Black-led organization. Right. Um, and so we are, actually people are looking at us mm. um, because they know the work that we've done. They know the community that we serve. Um, North Londell is a place where 
about 57% of the adult population in the community have some type of criminal background. Yeah. And you think about, you know, trying to get a job or, you know, th there's a stigma behind that, that, mm -hmm. and, and there's a whole cycle. It, it, it runs into this whole cycle of poverty. Um, the unemployment rate in um, North Lawndale is three times what the city of Chicago is. And so we are uniquely positioned right now to address what's going on. And so funders are coming to us. They're looking at us saying, hey, what do you need? Because they know we're on the front lines. Mm -hmm. They know who we're serving. They've seen the impact that we've done. And mm -hmm. even, you know, North Florida, we were created out of community input. Mm -hmm. So we did an 18-month study before we were even started. And, and we looked at this community and we said, what is needed? What's mm -hmm. needed most in the community? And jobs came up. And yeah. so, you know, um, people have a lot of confidence in what we can do and what we have done and what we will do. And so we're getting an out, uh, outpour of, of support um, from people asking, what can we do? And then not just on the funder side, I think it's just individuals who um, may not be able to participate in a protest or maybe that's not their thing, but they're looking for a way to get engaged and get involved. And um, they see us and they're saying, well, you know, what can I do? And so we've, we've seen great support um, and wake up the protests. Mm. You know, something that really, um, what you said earlier and also kind of going, going on with what Floyd was saying as well is listening and hearing and getting the actual feedback from the communities in which you serve um, is really key too. And I really like that common thread that's been sown by all of y'all um, about how it really is, yes, <laughs> DEI is like a topic or just racial equity is a topic that we all think, oh, we can just put on top of our organization and boom, all good. And it really is a very a iterative process and it's a very amalgamous type of um, thing to put on each and every different organization too because each mission and each community in which they reside in is so vastly different and it would be we wouldn't be doing the work or we wouldn't be mission centered as organizations if we weren't listening to the community communities that we were serving. And so I just really love that that central theme that you all are are talking about and addressing. Um, Manal. Hi, yeah. Um, so as somebody who's an external consultant to a lot of nonprofits, you know, the angle's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, it has been a again a mixed experience. I am remembering how many DEI consultants I know when the pandemic hit who had their projects put on hold or DEI professionals who lost their job, mm -hmm. who after George Floyd was murdered, there was this massive uptick in work. Mm -hmm. um, and while it's really heartening to see people, to see organizations want to really address this finally um, in a real way, it's also somewhat problematic, like the sense of urgency. Um, you know, one of the things I do is talk about how one of the characteristics of white uh, supremacy culture is a sense of urgency. Um, and, you know, sometimes what we need is radical slow change. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't want to be the person arguing for incrementalism or slow, you know, like that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you, um, if you start knocking down supporting structures, you know, um, and organizations start losing revenue or funding, mm -hmm. sometimes the first people to let go are black and brown people. Yes. In the middle of a pandemic when mm -hmm. health insurance is tied to your employment. And so not, you know, like it's really important to see the interdependencies and the complexity of the systems that we live in mm -hmm. and think about this on a systems level, not on a, am I individually doing the right thing, but how do my actions impact the people who are most vulnerable and the most affected by these things? Um, and the flip side of that is that with such an increase in demand for DEI consultants and work, um, you know, I'm having a really hard time resourcing consultants that are that I feel are good enough. Most yeah. of the people that I think are really good at this work are booked up. Yeah. And so when you come to me with like a sense of urgency, I'm like, I, you know, my biggest concern is that a year from now, there's going to be a stream of articles talking about how DEI trainings don't work. Mm. Because a lot of people went and hung up shingles who don't have an organizational or systems lens on this work. Right. 
and the way you do, and, and the one thing I'm also going to say, which um, may be difficult for some people on this call to hear, because I know you're nonprofits doing this work in communities, but the way you do this work in communities is not exactly the way you do it in an organization. Mm -hmm. And the reasons for that is that the power structures and dynamics are different. You don't vote out your CEO. Yeah the way you can vote out your president or your community leaders or your representatives. Yeah. And so it's really important um, to start with leadership. And if you're in an organization where you can't yet, then at least understanding your own power and privilege yeah. and where you actually have power to influence as opposed to where you don't. Yeah. Um, because if you don't have start with leadership and you try to do something that is beyond your scope of influence, what you will create is a lot of resistance in the organization that mm. then actually makes the work harder to do. Awesome. Wow. That like, <laughs> that hits it, you, know, you know, and it kind of makes me go back in time to all of these other, um, you know, nonprofit jobs that I had in the beginning of my career where it's like, there were so many power dynamics, you know, that were so rooted in white supremacy that um, were really just, I had to either, you know, buy into it or remove myself from it. And a lot of times I removed myself from it too. And so it's like, there's different dynamics that exist within the community, like what you were saying. And it's just, wow, it's really powerful to hear, hear that said. Yeah, and what I'll say is that, like, there's power dynamics that are white supremacy, but there's also what I've noticed is people who are very egalitarian minded sometimes mm -hmm. have a lot, they have a hard time owning the power that they have. Yeah. And when you can't own it, you become irresponsible with it. Mm -hmm. and, and more to that point, what I'm seeing is this drive for like consensus decision making on everything. Mm -hmm. And there are times when collaboration and consensus are really important. I'm also really concerned that what's going to happen is as people of color actually get opportunities to be in management and leadership, mm. consensus driven decision making will be used as another tool of white supremacy to question those people in power yeah. who are people of color. And mm. to some extent, you have to trust the people who are given decision making responsibilities you know, particularly when you start to see people of color or people from marginalized community assume those responsibilities and not use this sort of all or nothing. It has to always be consensus driven as a, as a, as sort of a red herring to then perpetuate white supremacy again, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? So really being aware of those power dynamics, which, and I know power is a difficult thing for a lot of people to talk about, but mm -hmm. if you're going to do DEI work, it's, yeah. it's critical that you learn how to talk about it. Absolutely. And, and, you know, a sentiment that someone all shared with me that's just stuck with me um, throughout my, you know, work in nonprofit has been um, as one moves up within an organization, white supremacy becomes way more sophisticated and nuanced in how it manifests itself. Um, and that's just something that I've always kept in the back of my mind, like, as as I've moved up, um, it's, it's become much more... Um, nuance in terms of power and authority and um it's it's really hard to to catch at times too all um, of this work is really subtle and nuanced yeah yeah absolutely the minute anybody tries to reduce it i'm like we're in trouble <laughs> yes yes <laughs> like, just are, you know so get the the biggest thing you can do is get comfortable with subtlety and nuance mm, yes um so moving to the next next question um can you all share an example of something you've done in your job or um, your team related to equity um, that the lar larger organization may not have been ready or willing to implement? Some of those tough, you know, we just talked about power, power dynamics, right? So sometimes there's a team of project managers or program managers that have this idea um, that may be centered in DEI and then they bring it to administration or the board. Um, and maybe there's some friction with that too. Um, and I'm just curious if maybe there's an example of something you've done in your, the work that y'all have done. Um, maybe there wasn't any friction, maybe it went smoothly and maybe it was an example of how things just should go. Um, so I'm curious, Jessica, um, do you have any examples of that or anything that you can speak to on that? Absolutely. So again, North Carolina Employment Network, we live and we breathe equity and, we, um, and inclusion. 
one thing we are doing, I think I mentioned this a little earlier, is we are forming an associate board really to leverage the energy um, of, of the moment that we are in. Um, because we know we need the help um, internally and we know people want to help. Um, but outside of North Lawndale Employment Network, I do volunteer. Um, there's this other organization that I'm really um, involved in. Um, it's, it's one of the top think tanks here in, in, in America, yeah. and there's very little diversity on the board. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm a part of uh, the Young Professional Board. And so one of the things that we are doing is really urging the, the big board, we say, um, yeah. to, to really include DEI in all and everything that it does. So one of the things we're doing is uh, developing a charter. Um, we are creating a video. Uh, a, a short video, each one of us are doing a little segment saying why DEI should be or must be, you know, um, just seen at all, uh, at all areas um, within our programming. And so that did take us to do a little bit of research. We had to do a lot of research. We looked at membership. We looked at um, who the members were of the council, what, how diversity really played into that. We did some uh, research on the programming that the council um, puts out on a yearly base basis. How diverse are the conversation? How diverse are the speakers? Mm. Um, we looked at the internal staff. How many, how many uh, people of color are actually at the organization? It's like two, very, very few. Um, but even the board, again, the board was, is just not diverse at all. Um, and so we are urging them to, to step it up, but not only are we urging them on our level, on the, the young professional uh, board level, again, we are developing a charter, we are creating a video, we are on our application to even apply for this, we are asking questions to ensure that the people are, that are applying um, have shared values on DEI that we have as well. So um, that's, that's just um, one example of what I could share of what, what I'm doing in that space. Absolutely. Yeah, Floyd. Yeah, so I was just reflecting a little bit on the, um, the last conversation that you guys had, you know, regarding power dynamics and the various power structures. So I'm sitting here being like remembered and re-triggered from all the things that I kind of had to endure at the beginning of my career. Um, and one of the, the things that I did at my organization <clears throat> was actually start a DNI committee. Um, and so, as I had mentioned, my, we're the 501c3 of a, of a larger organization that, you know, has made the Inc. 5000 a few times in a row and has a lot of different eyes on it and, and whatnot. And one of the things that I realized, you know, being in a sports, you know, related field was that there was a lot of various criticism that would come up where it be you know, the rules that we had are more engendered rules and didn't actually leave room for people who didn't fit within that, um, you know, in, in a specific spectrum or um, people would criticize our marketing and, and, and whatnot. And it wasn't that the people in our organization didn't feel as if it was important. It was just that they, one, didn't have the right tools to address the problems. And then they also didn't take enough time to get out of their own way, if that makes sense, and actually say, okay, hey, how do we look at these different things, these different criticisms from a different lens or from a different scope? Um, and so one of the things that I, you know, noticed immediately right away from being one of the only people of color in my organization was that we need some type of diversity and inclusion committee. We need some type of forum where people can be open and honest and just share, even if we don't have all the answers, even if we don't have all the tools ourselves, at least we need to create the structure. Uh, but I definitely would be lying if I didn't say it was difficult in and of itself getting something like that started, right? Like feeling like you have to, you know, negotiate or you have to talk to other people. You have to figure out, okay, how can we make this a little bit more important? You know what I mean? And how do we put this as a main priority um, mm -hmm. for people? And it was just very interesting because obviously I think where we're sitting now two and a half years later is very different from where we started. I feel like everybody's kind of rallying around and is very supportive and very on, on board. But mm -hmm. I want to, I, I envision a workplace one day when people can walk in and not have to convince other people of their worth, if that makes sense. You know, we should have a space where people can say, hey, you look different from me. You're coming from a different point of view. How do we now work together to create a new reality? You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. now I actually, to be honest, feel very proud of the work that we're doing. I feel very proud of, of how we, how everybody in the, you know, in the organization really rallies around, you know, specific topics. We actually create, you know, regular space for these kinds of 
you know, discussions to take place. I have a real budget, you know, to employ actual consultants and actually create systematic change. But, you know, saying in the beginning when you're trying to negotiate, hey, diversity and inclusion with a, versus a marketing budget or versus different things, it's hard, especially if you're young, especially if you're new to an organization and you have to feel like you have to convince yourself. So yeah. um, that, that's just something that, you know, we need to keep, keep in mind because it's very hard, especially if, you know, people are on this call and they're, you know, newer to their organizations. It can be difficult walking in and feeling like I can make all this change right away. But the yeah. thing that I always try to say is just start with where you're at. You know what I mean? Because now our diversity and inclusion committee is probably one of the largest committees, you know, in the entire organization. So it just mm -hmm. takes, takes that incremental change. Yeah. And I really like, you know, um, going back to like that thread that we're all weaving too of this idea too. And that's something that we've endeavored to try and do at N10 as well um, is DEI racial equity is something that's not just reserved for the committee that we have, right. but it's just questions that get asked up repeatedly in every single form or fashion of our department, be it fundraising, be it the NTC that we put on every single year, be it um, the programming department too. So I really like, and what resonated with me with what Jessica was saying was that um, it's so important to not just have it as like a side thing, but have it in every single conversation that we're having too. And that's mm -hmm. what I hear um, what you, you're saying as well, Floyd. And um, curious going into that, digging a little deeper too, is I see some questions about like, you know, how does this um, DEI and how do racial, how does racial equity work within the fundraising and marketing setting too? And I know Manal, um, you've done some consulting on that um, with organizations in regards to fundraising. So I'm curious if you can talk about some of those examples that you've, you've worked with organizations yeah. on. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Tristan. Um, so um, in terms of fundraising, the, the, the first recommendation I make, which is radical enough, but we'll get even more radical, um, is to, um, for fundraising teams, when you are collecting stories from beneficiaries or the people who benefit from your programs, you pay them for their stories. You are not a news organization. You are allowed to pay them. But more importantly, you are capitalizing on their intellectual property to mm. generate tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And so they need to be paid and they need to be paid like a Deloitte consultant, not like pizza and beer, what you pay your friends to help you move. Okay, mm -hmm. like, cause that is, you basically could not do your job without their input. And if you are making a salary that I assume is probably baseline 70, 80,000, anywhere upwards of six figures mm. and getting health insurance off of other people's stories, then you need to pay them for their intellectual capital. Mm -hmm. um, if you really want to go radical with this, um, and there are some philanthropic foundations who are starting to nudge against this, um, what I would encourage you to do is to, um, if your philanthropic donors are really concerned about racial equity, they should start advocating for paying more in taxes. Because the fact of the matter is that it, sh it is not democratic that people have to go kiss the hand of Bill Gates to get money to address reproductive justice. Mm. That money could be um, distributed through democratic systems mm. by paying taxes and then be democratically voted um, as to how it should be distributed so that things are not funded according to the interests of rich people. Mm. Um, and so you should start talking about that even yeah. because it's going to take a long time before anybody's going to be able to actually do that. Yes. But until we start talking about it, it's not even going to happen. Agreed. Agreed. Sorry, I've blown up the chat. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> rightfully so rightfully so um thank you so much and i'm sure we'll, we'll probably circle back to you know those those um elements as well too as we continue in the conversation too um you know at our work in n10 uh we see a really a big value in engaging the community and i know um we've all talked about that to some degree um in this conversation um engaging the community in our processes and decisions and Doing so also has a benefit, of course, in advancing equity. Can you all share ways you've engaged community members or advise 
organizations on engaging community, community members through the lens of fundraising or maybe not through the lens of fundraising um, um, to get community feedback to support some of those changes or some of those um, fundraising um, campaigns or investments you've made. Um, Floyd, let's start with you. Yeah, I think as a fundraiser, one of the things that I have seen is you know, a lot of organizations from my experience sometimes are afraid to approach joint funding. I feel like because there's such limited funding going around, especially for hard topics, you know, such as retro reconciliation and community building, organizations, I feel like it's like a rat race and they're kind of going against each other and not wanting to work with one another to build these coalitions. And so one of the things that I actually say is like, how are we applying for funding together? How are we submitting joint applications together and saying, okay, hey, you know, my organization can't solve this problem by itself. So why am I not bringing on, you know, three, four other organizations to tackle these bigger issues mm -hmm. um, and then approaching a bigger funder and saying, hey, this is what we want to do. This organization is going to solve this problem. This organization is going to solve this problem. We're going to meet weekly and bring it all together. Um, and so that's something that we're actually working on right now in Baltimore City and, and mobilizing a few other organizations um, to try and meet the issues that families are facing. Um, and I think that if you think that you can solve all these problems by yourself, that's already where the gap is. You know, um, we have to be able to understand how to come together and work together. So that's something, you know, that we kind of work on as an organization and something that I'm focused on. Mm. Wonderful. Um... Jessica, do you want to talk a little about um, how you engage communities? Absolutely, I certainly will. Um, so, you know, one example that I can provide is we are in the midst of a capital campaign, a $10 million capital campaign that we started in January 2019. Uh, we've raised seven seventy-five percent of that already. And um, Thank you. And so we're currently um, in the process of constructing a whole new building, a building that will be really a staple for the community and the folks that we serve. And so one way that I have engaged our community and our former clients, in fact, is bring them into the visioning process. As we are building this building, what should it look like? What mm. should be inside of it? Um, we have a connection with bees or we have a social enterprise sweet beginnings where uh, we provide transitional work 90 days transitional work for uh, formerly incarcerated folks to get um, get some job experience um, build 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 their job experience um, and build their resume um, so I've in engaged some of our former clients in these strategic conversations with our funders um, who, who are in our architects who are building the building. We're also hiring folks from the community. Um, to work on our, our building, to construct the building, um, mm. people who have went through our program. So mm. again, everything we do, um, it's really based on and out of community input and what's yeah. best for the community. Wonderful. You know, um, that reminds me of, you know, a similar, maybe not so successful capital campaign of an organization that I worked uh, worked with uh, previously. And I think the big gap that they missed as I'm reflective about that too, and you spoke so wonderfully about it is that uh, obviously the community engagement piece, but that was something that we just didn't do. And it, now it just seems so like, oh my gosh, why did we not ask the people that were building a building in their yeah. community, how they want it to look, sound, and feel. And I think that's something that's really um, important in terms of capital campaigns, in terms of fundraising, is having a community, I don't want to say outlet, but also another a community avenue with which to advise on those decisions. And, you know, not only just advise just because, oh, we have the community committee, they're there just to check a box, but no, like actually take what they're saying Absolutely. into consideration and maybe sometimes that changes the flow and the trajectory of the organ or not the organization but the campaign so I really love that that example thank you so much uh Minnell uh, yeah so um I don't um sort of as an external consultant my access with communities is less however um, we have done work on communications for nonprofits and how to externally communicate about things like racial disparities. Um, I know I'm a little bit off script because I wanted to stay with the community angle, but um, 
we did a report for the Horizon Foundation on racial disparities in health. And actually, we've done a lot of research in, um, in communications, not only in terms of like what's traditionally taught in terms of targeting, but mm. framing DEI and how you can frame it in a way that decreases the resistance when it's a topic of public discourse. Mm -hmm. And um, I've done webinars for the communications network on this, on the fact that the biggest obstacle to equity in our society is the myth of the self-made man or bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. And so if you start by talking about racial disparities, people will attribute those disparities to individual agency. So you have to start by talking about the system. Mm. And when you talk about the system, people can usually logically deduce, oh, there's probably some places where the system isn't working. And then they can see how that affects different groups based on race, rather than attributing like health disparities to like people choosing to be unhealthy mm. or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so when working with communities, you know, we, and so we did a project with the Horizon Foundation where we, we prototyped a message and then brought it to the grantees to, to get their feedback. And we use a design thinking approach, which allows us to sort of test out messaging with the people who will be affected before we take it to the people who have power. Mm. That's wonderful. That's a great, great observation. Um, you know, we're at 1044. And um, we have about one more question um, for y'all to answer. And um, the question is, what is your final reminder or ask or challenge to folks in this session um, and folks listening today um, for their work in fundraising and also just working in an organization um, in terms of racial equity and DEI? So Manol, we'll start with you. Um. I got distracted by the chat, Tristan. I apologize. Can you just sure. repeat that? I'm sorry. I'm not even going to pretend that I no can. No worries. Think. No worries. It's a conversation, of course. We get. I know. Like, Wait. There's like ten like things on chat going on right now. Right. Right. I'm. A, I am not a multitasker. I'm like. I am a unitasker. So, <laughs> so if you just repeat. Yes. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So um, the the question is, what's your final reminder or ask or challenge yeah. folks listening in on this session today? Yeah. So, um, so like I said, the biggest obstacle is this myth of bootstrapping or self-made mm -hmm. man. And so really what every individual could do that would change our public discourse around this topic is to tell your personal stories of success in a way that credits the system around you. Mm -hmm. So for example, like so I, sometimes people will, you know, congratulate me on running a business that's doing well and being an entrepreneur. The fact of the matter is that I had the name Brevity and Wit for like 10 years. And it mm. wasn't until three years ago that I could actually commit full time and make it a, a business that's in the black. And the reason was I got married. And I had my husband's like middle class income as a little bit of a buffer. And I had his union negotiated health insurance. And I wasn't any more intelligent or hardworking or entrepreneurial the day before I got married as I was the day after. Mm. The key factor, the lever that switched that for me was getting married. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be the case. And that doesn't mean I didn't work hard, but success is based on both hard work and system support. Mm -hmm. And what we miss is that sometimes there are people who are working really hard. Like we think that if people are unsuccessful, they're not working mm -hmm. hard, but often it's, they are working really hard and they don't have the system support. Mm -hmm. And so it's really incumbent upon me whenever I'm talking to people about being an entrepreneur or a business owner or a woman owned business that I credit that fact so that, so that we start to unmask the system. Yeah. And make visible the system. And so that we can tell people you shouldn't be beating yourself up if this isn't working for you because I didn't start working any harder the day after I got married as I was all those years before. Mm. So that's what I would say is to tell your story in a way that makes the system visible for others. Wow, wonderful. Thank you so much, Manol. Um, Floyd. Wow, I'm sitting here like, whew, that's so true. <laughs> um, for me, I would say start with where you're at and start with what's in your hand. I think for me, I always thought, you know, 
maybe it's having imposter syndrome or feeling like, how can I change this big organization? I'm just one person. But I think the thing that just continued to be my internal compass was start with what I have, start with what's important to me. If something doesn't feel right, don't be afraid to speak up about it because you staying silent is exactly what the system wants. It's exactly, people want us to be quiet. And that's exactly why we live in the world that we live in today. But we, if we have light, if we have life, if we're breathing, we have the opportunity to make an impact and make a difference. So start with what you have, start with what's in your hand. If you can't figure it out, keep knocking until someone answers that door because the door will be opened eventually and you can figure it out. We can figure it out together. So start with what you have. Wonderful. You know, I really like that idea that you've um, wove through the entire discussion is just starting with what you have and where you're at too. And I think for me, it's been um, one of those situations where I've felt like, you know, being the only black person, or being the only indigenous person on a staff, it's like, God, start with what I have. I guess I'm just going to speak my truth and do those things. And sometimes that was a very lonely experience um, working in a nonprofit in a very white dominant toxic structure um, at work. And it was just a lonely experience. But I think, you know, for me, I continued that path of, you know, if I'm going to speak my truth, I'm going to speak my truth and start with what I have and start with what I know. And I think for me, my, my, my advice for anyone would be to um, start there and it'll be daunting in the beginning. If you're a person of color, um, if you're a black person, an indigenous person, a person of color in those organizations and you're one of one or two people in the organization. And I would say it's, um, it's daunting and it's scary. And, but also, once you get the um, the courage to continue to do that and you stand firm in your truth, then you can start to really think critically about the jobs that you're going to have further on down the line. And if this is going to be worth what I'm going to be doing, or if it's going to be more of a um, emotional toll to be a part of too. And to my, uh, the folks, the white folks in the room, I would also say, hey, you know, don't always rely on the black indigenous people of color that you work with the one or two people that you work with to shoulder all of that emotional trauma burden all of those things it kind of goes back to um what uh manal was talking about in that you know being able to pay the people for what they're worth in the story that they have told and so i i know not all organizations are white-led um, but I think in, in some of the cases that I've been in, it's been white led and I really appreciated the few times that white folks spoke up and said, this isn't wrong, this is wrong and I don't like leaning on Tristan or um, the other people of color in the room to have to carry this conversation. And um, I think that's sometimes endemic in, in the nonprofit world too. Um, and so Jessica, <laughs> with that being said, I wanna give you the last word. And um, in, in a message that you would like to send to, to everyone um, in, the, in, the, in the session today. Thanks, Tristan. You know, one, one thing I would say on, um, on, on what you just, on, on, your, on your point is, I've had so many people um, of all different races really reach out and say, um, oh my gosh, what can we do? I, I'm so sorry and this is happening to you. But then <laughs> um, there's also been there, there's been people who have just, that don't look like me, who yeah. have just impressed the heck out of me right. on how they're standing up, yes. on how they're saying no, um, and how they're actually leading some of these efforts and saying <laughs> enough is enough. Yes. So I just want to thank everybody you know, who's supporting this effort yep. because we need everybody. Yes. My last word to you all is August is Black Philanthropy Month. Yes. And so on 828, it is a national day to give Black and support Black-led organizations. Um, so I encourage each and every one of you to find an organization like NLEN or, mm -hmm. or any other Black-led organizations who are out there doing the great work and support them. Thank you. Wonderful. What a great ending to a great session. Um, before we roll out, I would ask that uh, Floyd, Jessica, and Minnell um, put their um, social media contacts if they want to in the chat so everyone has um, access to, to those um, 
you know, platforms um, and your voices because your voices are so important to this, um, to this work that we're doing too. And, um, you know, Black Lives Matter. And I really, really um, hope that we can continue this conversation and we can continue to work together and separately to make sure that we're all uplifting the movement and um, racial equity across nonprofit. Thank you, Tristan, for having us. And Jessica and Floyd, it was really a lovely honor to be with you on this panel. Awesome. Great chatting with you all. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Talk soon. Thank you all so much for being part of this amazing discussion. I can't even express how much I appreciate you just sharing these amazing insights and your stories. And um, I think everyone, I, I, everyone was so moved. I'm nearly speechless, as you can tell. So um, I, yeah, I can't um, say even anything more. I just thank you so much for sharing and for the amazing discussion. I think there's so many takeaways, um, really practical takeaways as well that, you know, nonprofits can, can actually implement and stand for equity in their organization. So um, this uh, conversation was um, essential. So uh, thank you so much for being a part of it. And I'm, you know, just, I feel blessed to even listen in. So <laughs> uh, thank you again.